Episode 11, Chapter 10 Chapter 10 No, he didn't, Katala. Yes, he did, Coco. I saw him. You know better than to make up stories. I'm not making stories. He went in there. How could he have? There's no door. There was, though. Two young girls, sisters, sat crouched in front of the shrine high above Kakariko village. The old Chika shrine had always been there, as far as they were concerned. Koko, the eldest of the two, but still a mere child of eight, knew that the old shrine was important because of how Nana always came up here to clean it of the creeping vines that liked to grow up it. She was observant like that. Her sister, Katala, was only five and not nearly as observant. She did have a very good imagination, though. Katala, we need to go back down. It's almost supper time, and Papa won't be happy if we're late. Their father was known to the two girls as Papa, though the other townspeople in Kakariko village called him Dorian. Koko and Katala's mother had died two years prior, though Katala did not really understand that. Koko did, though, and regularly visited her mother's small gravestone. She did not tell Papa that she knew, though he had tried very hard to keep them from understanding what had happened to their mother. Koko was observant, though, so she knew. K.O.K.O. -K -O. I want to see him come out. Katala drew her name out in just the way that got on Koko's nerves. Caught L.A., he can't come out. There is no door. Yes, there is. The old shrine had changed some in the last two weeks. It had sat there, on top of the cliff overlooking Kakariko village, black and imposing, for a long time. There was only one way up to it, by way of a steep winding path that led up to the magic forest. Or so Coco and Katala called it because of the magical lady. Now, however, it had started glowing orange. Actually, it had changed again, as now the light around its base was blue while the Shika eye up top was still orange. Still, though, there was no way that Katala was right about Link going into the shrine. After all, there were no doors even if it did. Look like there should be a doorway. Katala had probably made it up. Maybe she fell asleep and dreamt it. Sometimes, when they fell asleep in or near the magic forest, they had weird dreams of a lady with long, blonde hair and a sparkly necklace, who played with them. Maybe this was just like that. Finally, feeling agitated with her little sister, Coco grabbed Katala's hand tightly in her own, beginning to tug her towards the path that led back down to the village so that they could go home. Katala struggled, but Coco was bigger and stronger than she was, so she held on tightly. Suddenly, there was a flash of blue light from behind them and Coco quickly turned around, eyes wide, as little blue specks swirled around the circle at the base of the shrine, which was now glowing with bright blue light. The blue specks spiraled faster before coming together, taking shape, and fading. In their place, Link stood. His shoulders were slumped, and he looked sad, just like Papa looked some nights when he thought Coco was asleep. He was wearing a pretty blue tunic. He was dusty, though, and his cheek had a scrape on it that had been smeared with blood. Link turned to look up at the shrine, which, to Coco's surprise, had now turned all blue, the Sheikah eye included. She didn't know what that meant, but Link apparently did, as she saw him nod and turn. His eyes fell on Coco and Katala and he froze, eyes widening. I'm Mr. Link. Coco couldn't understand how Link had arrived, or where he had come from. Could Katala have been telling the truth? Did you? Were you in the shrine? Link stared at Coco before his posture subtly changed. He stood up straighter, taking a deep breath, and smiling at Coco. He approached and knelt on the dirt in front of them. Coco wondered if that scrape on his cheek hurt it looked like it must. I was in there. I had to get some things done, and Lady Impa told me I could go in. Link hesitated, looking between Coco and Katala. Finally, he brought a finger to his lips. But, shh, shh. It's a secret. Coco nodded, happy to participate in a secret. At least this one was a good secret. Of course, Katala wouldn't keep the secret at all. She was not very good at it. She would probably tell everyone in the village before the day was up. Coco would try to rein her in, though. Link smiled warmly at the sisters and then held up one hand, standing up. He hurried over to a tree growing at the edge of the cliff, where he knelt down and picked something up. A moment later, he approached them again, holding a pair of little yellow flowers. Here, Link said kneeling back in front of the girls. He held the flowers out to them, one in each hand. 
I saw these and thought that you two might like them. Naturally, Coco and Cotilla, being little girls of only eight and five, were more than delighted to take the little yellow flowers from Link. Coco stuck hers in her hair, while Cotilla just held hers tightly in her fist she'd probably ruin it. A few moments later, after Link bade them farewell, Coco gave him her best cheek about, she had been practicing in front of her mirror lately, and led her sister down the path, leaving Link behind on top of the cliff. Curse the ancient Sheikah, thought Link as he sat down against the base of the newly activated Sheikah shrine. He reached up and touched his cheek, wincing at the flare of fiery pain that he felt at the touch. If I did not know better, I would think that they wanted to kill me. This shrine had seemed to focus more on utilizing the remote bomb rune, with several sections of wall and doors that he used the bombs to blast through. It had felt strange, destroying parts of the ancient Sheikah shrine, and Link found himself wondering at the wisdom of the ancient Sheikah in making a shrine that existed purely to be partially destroyed. It hadn't been quite as challenging, he supposed, as the first shrine had been, but he learned very quickly how far back he needed to stand when blowing up sections of rock. The explosive blasts sent out pieces of shrapnel surprisingly far, as evidenced by his bloodied cheek and several bruises hidden underneath his clothing. He wore the Sky Blue Champion's tunic, which proved to be an advantageous decision, if not one he was still thoroughly uncomfortable with. It fit well, almost as if Impa had taken his measurements before having it tailored, and allowed him better freedom of movement than the tunic and armor pieces provided to him by Telma. Ultimately, he had decided to wear it, not for its protective value or greater flexibility, but because some of the members of the Sheikah tribe would still know what the tunic stood for. It would give them hope, and Link felt that was the least of what his duties should be. Even if it was just a false hope. Sighing softly, he stood, stretching and wincing at a sharp pain in his knee, brought about by another flying piece of blast shrapnel. He would, perhaps, take Impa up on her offer to have a hot bath drawn for him. He had refused that morning based purely on the fact that Impa seemed to be offering it to Link for the express purpose of embarrassing Paya. She seemed to be very bothered by the thought of Link spending time in their bathing chamber. Now, however, it sounded wonderful. He would remain in Kakariko village one more night and, hopefully, depart the next morning for Zora's domain, which Impa had marked on his map as being to the north. As he prepared to walk down the path, something out of the corner of his eye drew his attention, and he glanced towards the forest further up above the shrine. He glimpsed a flash of blue and frowned, his initial thought was that of Sheikah technology. The blue light disappeared, however, so Link decided to investigate. Walking up the hill, he entered the forest, surprised to find the forest quite dark. The canopy overhead was extremely thick, blocking out much of the sunlight. The darkness was not the only strange thing about the forest either. It had a strange feel to it it was too quiet and the air felt heavier. As Link walked further in, he noticed something else strange. There were no twigs or leaves on the ground. Thick, green grass covered everything, growing shockingly well, regardless of the perpetual shadow created by the canopy of trees. Flowers of every type, shape, and color grew along with the grass. The hair on Link's arm stood up as he ventured deeper into the shadowy woods. Nothing seemed disturbed in this place. The grass even seemed to resist his own footprints somehow, springing back up with alacrity after he removed a foot. He did see some animals, however. A large brown squirrel sat on a branch, watching him, and in the distance, through the trees, he could see a buck with massive antlers grazing. The forest seemed frozen in time. Alive and without decay. Ethereal. Another flash of blue caught his eye, and he turned from the buck, which had lifted its head to gaze at Link, and looked to the path before him. Standing several paces away was a creature of the likes Link had never seen. It was roughly the size and shape of a large hare, with large hind quarters and a smaller pair of front legs. Its face, however, was anything but rabbit-like. Instead, it seemed to have the head of an owl, with shining yellow eyes and a small, pointed beak. Atop its head seemed to be two fern fronds, sticking up much like a rabbit's ears would have. Its entire body shone with a bright otherworldly blue light, and Link could see that the grass around the creature was lit by the light from its body. Amazed at the strange creature, Link crouched slowly, his eyes never leaving it. The creature, likewise, seemed to meet Link's eyes. One of its ears twitched in a way that seemed to imply curiosity, and it tilted its head to the side slightly. After several moments of gazing at Link, it bounded forward a few feet. Link's eyes widened slightly, and he cautiously reached one of his hands out towards the creature. The creature looked at Link's hand, tilting its head, and Link held his breath. Finally, the blue creature took a few more tentative steps forward and leaned its head forward in a curious way. Link felt its beak touch his fingertip. 
An electric shock ran up Link's arm and he gasped sharply, his entire body tingling with a strange energy. At his gasp, the blue creature pulled back, looking up at him with wide yellow eyes. Those eyes seemed to see into Link, and he imagined that he could see his own shocked expression reflected back at him in them. They remained like this for a time, gazes locked, while the strange energy that Link had felt dissipated. As it faded, Link found himself wanting to experience the strange feeling again, and he hesitantly reached his hand forward again. This time, however, the blue creature did not reach out and touch him. At Link's movement, it pulled back, looking at his hand he could have sworn that it even shook its head very slightly. Then, startling Link with its suddenness, it turned and darted away into the brush. The blue light winked out, and the forest, which had seemed so bright in the creature's presence, grew dark once more. Link waited for the creature to reappear. It had run into a bush, but surely it would come out again, glowing brightly, and bathing the forest in its soothing light again. But as he waited, it soon became apparent to him that whatever the creature had been, it would not be reappearing. Its light seemed to have disappeared completely, not even able to be seen from within the bush it had hidden in. He stood on shaky legs, looking around the dark forest. It had grown still. Link could no longer see the buck or the squirrel from earlier. The strange heaviness about it remained, however, and he decided that his curiosity had been sated for the time being. As he walked back out, he did not notice that his knee no longer ached. It would not be until later that evening, as he prepared for the hot bath that he requested from Impa, that he would notice that, underneath the dried blood, his cheek was whole and unblemished by the scratch that had drawn the blood. When he did notice these strange things later that evening, his mind was drawn back to the curious blue rabbit-like creature and the energy he felt at its touch. He felt a surreal sense of wonder at the experience, but ultimately, chose not to bring it up to Impa, not wishing for an explanation. The next morning saw Link departing Kakariko village at the first sign of dawn. Just like the time before, many of the villagers had come out to see him off. Like the day before, he wore his blue tunic, which he had worked to clean of dust and debris from the shrine's challenges the day before. He wore his sword and Sheikah shield upon his back, for good measure. If he were being honest, he would have rather ride out before anyone had woken, but Impa's words to him haunted him. He could provide hope. He rode out through an alternate path that took Link through another, narrower pass that led out onto a high ground overlooking what Impa had called the Lanayru wetlands. This route was not nearly as long as the route that Telma had taken to get to Zora's domain, traveling back out and around the dueling peaks before turning north, but it was also one that would have been impossible for her to take with her cart, due to the lack of any consistent road once out of the path and the it, time steep decline that led down before finally reaching the distant road. As Link rode out of the pass, his eyes were, once again, drawn to the distant Hyrule castle. He was quite a bit closer to it than he had been before, and he could make out certain details better now. A series of massive pillars that looked distinctly Sheikah in nature, jutted out of the ground surrounding the castle. They appeared to be as tall as the castle's tallest towers and glowed with a strange reddish light, rather than the typical blue or orange. To Link's reckoning, it appeared there were five of them surrounding the castle and town ruins at the base of the castle. Link sat atop spirit, rigid, his eyes fixed on the distant castle. Would he see the great beast rise up once again? If Ganon did show himself again, would he sink back down within the castle, as before, or would he finally break free of Princess Zelda's grasp? How much longer could Zelda contain Calamity Ganon? Would Link, despite his best efforts, be too late to change anything? Had he been resurrected just to watch the land fall again? He grimaced, looking away from the castle, ashamed of his thoughts. Thankfully, as he carefully rode Spirit down the incline to where he could get back on the distant road, Ganon did not rise above the castle. It would seem that the princess was still doing her duty. The least Link could give her was do his. The sun was dipping below the western horizon by the time Link reached the wetland stable. The first thing that stuck out to Link as he approached the squat building, was that its proximity to Hyrule Field and the castle had clearly governed how this way station was built up over time. Situated on a hill overlooking a south-flowing river that ran between the Lanayru wetlands and the Hyrule Field, the wetland stable was clearly built with defense in mind. The forested areas around the stable had been cleared of trees, many of which had been cut, sharpened, and stuck into the ground with points facing outward around the stable. Furthermore, two watchtowers had been built, one each to the north and south, and Link could see a guard in each one, armed with bows. Another small building had been built next to the stable, and, from this, Link saw a man wearing leather armor and wielding a spear walk out. Perhaps a barracks of sorts? The stable itself seemed normal enough, albeit somewhat larger than the Dueling Peaks stable. 
As Link approached, he noted a patch of burnt grass just inside the stable's perimeter, and several broken arrows sticking out of the ground just outside of the perimeter. Not only was this way station prepared for battle, but it had also seen it and recently. He felt an odd mixture of apprehension and happiness to see others fighting back. Link expected to be stopped by the guards in the towers, but no one said anything as Link carefully maneuvered spirit around the spikes that made up the perimeter. Now that he was closer to the stable, he had begun to hear sounds of music and singing coming from the inside of the stable, which had the immediate effect of lifting his spirits. He quickly dismounted, handing spirits reins to a stable boy, and walked towards the stable's entrance. Once he entered, he was greeted with a sight that was both delightful and slightly confusing. The large common room had quite a few wooden tables set up in rows, and several of the benches were lined with men and women in leather armor, as well as a smaller number of people that looked to be travelers or merchants. Several serving women weaved between the tables, carrying drinks or platters of food. The people in the common room seemed happy, talking amongst themselves, laughing, or singing. The reason for this was clear as Link's eyes swept the common room with some surprise. In the back of the room, on a platform made up of a large wooden box, stood one of the members of the Rita race. The Rito was tall, significantly taller than Link and broader of chest and shoulder, with blue and white plumage and a large black beak. He eagerly played an instrument like an accordion while singing along with a deep, resonant voice. His clearly enjoyed playing, and though his beak was rigid, a combination of his eyes and other facial muscles seemed to give the impression of a broad smile. As Link crossed the room to a table to listen and, hopefully, order a meal, the Rito's eyes fell on him. For the briefest of moments, the Rito's music faltered. His golden eyes met Link's blue, sharp and focused, but then his eyes closed, the music continued. If the other patrons had even noticed, they said nothing. Link, however, felt slightly bemused but chose not to worry too much about it. Several minutes later, the Rito ended his song with a smattering of applause from the gathered patrons. He smiled and gave a slight bow before his eyes roamed over the gathered people. A few of the drunker patrons began to shout out song requests, but the Rito simply raised one feathered hand while precariously balancing his accordion with the other, his eyes, again, falling on Link, who had just ordered his meal. Friends. The Rito lowered his hand to his accordion and played a long, sweet note. There will be more time for requests, I assure you. The night is young still, after all. But first, I feel particularly inspired to play a song that has been handed down since ancient times. It is a song of heroes and villains, courage and magic, and a great victory. It is a true story, the one from long ago. The crowd responded positively, which caused the Rito to smile and begin to sway slightly as he played additional notes on his accordion, slow and methodical. The kingdom of Hyrule is a vast and storied land, oft grasped in the palm of a villainous hand, he began to sing, his voice warm and commanding. The rest of the room fell silent, with even the serving women pausing in their work to watch. A dark force of destruction, many times undone, rises once again Ganon, the calamitous one. Link's blood ran cold. But hope survives in Hyrule, for all is not lost, two brave souls protect it, no matter the cost. A goddess blood princess and a fearless knight, they appear in each age to fight the good fight. Their battle with Ganon I've committed to song, to keep it through time, no matter how long. He felt suddenly panicked, wanting to leave this place, to travel through the night. He had not wished to be cornered with his failure once again this night, to be reminded of all that he couldn't remember. Now begins the second verse, listen and you'll know, of their battle with Ganon ten thousand years ago. The kingdom of Hyrule was once a land of lasting peace, a culture of such strength and wit, that suffering did cease. But Ganon lurked beneath the surface, strengthening its jaws, so the ancient people of Hyrule set out to help the cause. Their efforts bore fruit in an automated force, to help avert calamity by sealing it at its source. Four giant behemoths for which power never ceased, each of these titans was called a divine beast. And free-willed machines that hunted down their prey, these guardians were built to last so they could join the fray. Link remained rooted to his seat, though his face felt flushed and his hands gripped his knees tightly under the table. The song spoke of what Impa and Roam had told him of the legendary hero, his predecessor, that had defeated Ganon so many years ago. He felt a strange mixture of shame and relief to know that the song was, at the very least, not about him personally. To guide the beasts in battle, warriors were needed, so four champions were pledged to see Ganon defeated. Divine beasts, champions, princess, and knight, their plan to rout Ganon was looking airtight. And when Calamity Ganon reared its head, Hyrule rose against it, the optimism of Hyrule all the more incensed it. Ganon raged in its assault, boiling with hate, it gnashed its teeth and thrashed about, but it was all too late. The Guardians kept the heroes safe through every hour, the Divine Beasts unleashed attacks that weakened Ganon's power. 
the song seemed familiar to Link. Something, in the dark, impenetrable recesses of his memory seemed to click into place. Even though he could not remember anything specific, he was certain that he had heard this song before, but when the Rito had stated the song was from ancient times could he truly have heard it in his past? The hero with the sealing sword struck the final blow, and the holy power of the princess sealed Ganon so. And that is the story of the brazen attack, on Calamity Ganon ten thousand years back. The Rito stopped singing, playing his slow, somber tune for several additional seconds before finishing one with final, long note. For a long time, silence reigned in the common room. The silence was eventually broken by one man, whose words slurred with drunkenness. Hey, Cass. I thought you said that was a true story. The Rito named Cass turned to the man and smiled, nodding his head in acknowledgement. I did. Then why, in the gods' names, is that castle standing destroyed, and why do I have to fight off monsters every other day? Cass' smile faltered slightly, but he nodded again. This song, of course, spoke of the ancient hero and princess from ten thousand years past, who achieved victory against the Calamity Ganon. These were not the same individuals that fought against Ganon one hundred years ago, before the Age of Burning Fields. Obviously. A woman near spoke this time, and several others muttered agreement with her. Link felt his heart sink even further. Friends, Cass said, holding up one more calming hand. The story from one hundred years ago is another tale, indeed, and not one that I am prepared to tell this evening. However, in the defense of the princess in her night, the Calamity Ganon has been subdued, at least for a time. The woman beside Link snorted derisively. And a good lot that has done us. You can't walk one hundred feet into Hyrule Field without being ambushed by monsters, or worse. No princess, no hero, and that creature hovering over the castle. My daughter keeps having nightmares about it. Link abruptly stood from the table, causing a handful of people to glance at him, Cass included. He stepped over the bench and stepped outside of the stable, taking a deep, shaky breath of the cool night air. It had gotten dark, and both stars and fireflies alike had emerged in the night air. Link leaned against the outer wall of the stable, wishing he could just melt into it and disappear. He wondered if, perhaps, he should just use the Sheikah Slate to teleport back to Kakariko Village or even Hateno. Or gods, maybe the Demmed Great Plateau. Perhaps another hundred year slumber would do him some good. He closed his eyes, breathing deeply, trying not to think of his lost memories, his failure, or his shame and, of course, thinking of all of these things in turn. He heard the soft footsteps approaching and, with a sigh, opened his eyes. With some surprise, he found Cass standing beside him. Good evening. Cass bowed his head to Link in greeting, which Link returned, hoping that might be the end of it. It wasn't. You are an unfamiliar face to me I tend to pride myself in knowing most of the travelers in this region of the country. They tend to have some of the best stories, you see. Link considered his words carefully, having learned his lesson about poorly thought out lies. He knew some things a little better now, at least. I'm from Hateno Village. Have you been there? Cass tilted his head slightly. Hateno? No, I must confess that my travels have not yet taken me that far east, though I hope to do so soon. Link relaxed and allowed himself a small smile. It is a nice village. Home. He reflected as he spoke that he hadn't yet told a lie, even if his intent had been misdirection. He was from Hateno village just the Hateno of one hundred years prior. If you do not mind my asking, what brings you so far west and north? Cass had a very refined way of speaking with a deep voice that Link had, frankly, not expected from a race of avian people. What had he expected, though? Squawks? I'm traveling to, he hesitated for just a moment before deciding the truth would serve him just fine in this case. Zora's Domain. Cass' eyes widened and he smiled. To Zora's Domain, you say? What a wonderful coincidence. I, too have begun a trek to Zora's domain. I've heard of some troubles with the ancient divine beast there, and I wish to see it for myself. Link's heart sank. This seemed to be quite an unfair turn of events. You are investigating the divine beast. Oh. You know of the divine beasts, then? Wonderful. Many people that I have spoken to from your region are not exceptionally aware of such things. Of course, one hundred years is not quite enough time for their existence to fall into legend, but some are simply unaware of their veracity. In fact, many children I speak to. Cass seemed suddenly embarrassed, the feathers around his neck puffing out slightly. 
I did not mean to compare you to a child, please forgive me. Link shook his head to indicate no offense taken, after which Cass looked relieved. He smiled. I merely meant that, unless you live in the shadow of one such creation, it is easy to dismiss them as fables or exaggerations. We Rito, naturally, have lived with Vometo for the last 100 years, so their truth is not lost on us. Vometo. The divine beast piloted by the Rito, Rivali. A champion that perished at Ganon's rise. The facts played through Link's mind like a mantra. He had done his best to commit these things to memory since leaving Kakariko village. But of course, you asked me a question, did you not? You asked if I was investigating the divine beast, Varuda? That is not my intent, exactly, no. You see, I am a traveling minstrel, as I am sure you may have guessed. I once studied under the renowned Shika poet, Rao, who was the court poet for the royal family before their fall 100 years ago. Cass turned, glancing towards the distant castle. The red haze shone around the castle, lightly illuminating its lower sections. Thankfully, no beast rose up over it. He long wrote and sung of the time and heroes from before the calamity, you see. Specifically, of the Princess Zelda, her knight, and the four champions that fought to prevent Ganon's rise. Oh, that is just fantastic. Is that so? And I am continuing my late master's life work in my travels. I am traveling to Zora's domain now with the hopes that I may discover more of Mipha, the Zora champion, in order to continue my master's epic, which he left, tragically, unfinished when he perished many years ago. Link hit a grimace, looking at the grass by their feet while considering Cass' words. Absently, he wondered how this kept happening to him. He supposed that it shouldn't have been too surprising 100 years wasn't so long that his failures would just be forgotten, even if most of those alive today did not know his identity. Is everything all right? Cass looked at him curiously, and Link felt his face flush. You look concerned. Oh, I just, Link faltered. It's just... Sad. What happened to her, and the other champions? Cass nodded sagely. Yes, indeed. A true tragedy. Such hopes were placed upon the six, and for it all to end so direly. Silence fell between them for a time before Cass continued. Of course, I do not fully believe that all hope is lost. Link looked up at Cass, eyebrows raised. When Cass saw his expression, he chuckled softly. Well, perhaps it is my tendency to prefer stories with a happier ending, but I believe that these things work themselves out more often than not. But they lost. Did they? They all died. Did they? Link's voice caught, and he stared up at Cass' golden eyes. Those golden eyes seemed too knowing to him. Finally, Cass smiled and shrugged his feathery shoulders. Of course, the six are no longer with us. Certainly, the four champions perished in the battle. The knight, legends tell, fell at the prince's feet in the shadow of Fort Hateno. The princess, however. Cass looked towards the castle. From what I have been able to gather, she went, alone, to the castle and faced Calamity Ganon with her sealing powers. And here we are, alive, so many years later. What about what that woman said? The monsters are terrorizing travelers. From what I've seen, few even venture west of the dueling peaks. Cass nodded in acknowledgement. What you speak of is true. But I would suggest that the proliferation of monsters along our roads is not the fault of the six. When Link opened his mouth to object, Cass held up a hand. Please, let me explain. From what I have heard, it is true that the monsters have gained strength since Ganon's re-emergence. But they existed prior to his rise and will likely continue to exist if he is defeated. Before the fall of Hyrule, the king did not rely on Princess Zelda to patrol the roads for moblins, however. That duty was left to common soldiers. Now, of course, we lost much of the organized military to Ganon and his guardians. But you cannot tell me that others cannot rise up to fight back. But if all the soldiers and knights died, Link said, but Cass had, apparently, not finished. You look as if you are a warrior. I would hazard a guess that you have, indeed, fought some of these creatures, have you not? Link nodded reluctantly, and Cass smiled in triumph. See? If we simply had more individuals like you, perhaps we could secure these roads once again. All of the races have warriors. The Sheikah are still renowned for their abilities in stealth and precision, 
Gorons are capable of repelling entire groups of enemies alone, the Zora are swift and still have a standing military force, the Garuto are an entire race of warriors, and Wirito are known as the finest archers in the land. You Hylians, of course, are also well known for your history of great and noble warriors. So what excuse do we have? The Great Calamity was disastrous, yes, but it was also 100 years ago. However, instead of reclaiming the sections of our land that have been lost to Ganon's minions, we, instead, appear to be waiting to die. Or, perhaps, to be rescued. Link remained silent, eyes focused on the distant castle. He didn't know how to respond to all of that. He wanted to take hope in what he said, to be able to pass some of the blame for the nation's state on to others. But he could not. How could he? This would have never even happened, were it not for his failure. Cass did, eventually, break the silence with a softer tone. I apologize if I caused any offense. I did not mean to imply that individuals such as you should be doing more. Only that we, the various peoples of Hyrule, should be working together, rather than taking refuge in our homes. Link shook his head, exhaling slowly. He still wasn't sure what he could say, so he chose to say nothing. It also occurs to me that I never asked your name. That seems inexcusably rude on my part, so, please. You know my name, might I know yours? Link. Link. Cast tone was curious. Link's blood ran cold and he inwardly cursed himself. Why would he have used his real name when talking to this person, who clearly knew much of the past? It is fascinating, then, that you wear that tunic. Is it? Link tried to keep his voice carefully even, but he still refused to meet Cass' eyes. He did not want to see that knowing expression. It appears to be the same color worn by the champions of old, based on what I have been told. And Link was the name of the princess knight and wielder of the master sword. I didn't know that. Link glanced briefly up at Cass and tried to give him something of an innocent smile. Cass met his eyes, still smiling. Yes, well, such details are often lost to time. The hero's name, especially, often appears to change in stories and myths, depending on the person telling the story. Some even mistakenly call him by the prince's name, as silly as that might sound. Cass chuckled softly at this, and Link forced himself to smile. But I have it on good authority that the knight was named Link, as you are. That is strange. Link looked away from Cass again, and, this time, Cass allowed the silence to stretch. Some time later, Cass cleared his throat. It is clear that these subjects give you pause. I apologize for any discomfort caused by my musings. Link sighed and looked over at Cass, shaking his head. No, it's just... I have a lot on my mind. It isn't your fault. Again, Cass gave him that piercing stare. Then, perhaps, can I suggest you try the bold fruit ale? I have heard from many patrons that it does wonders. It tends to do wonders for my purse as well. Link stared back at him for a long moment, confused, and then his lips pulled into a smile. Cass opened his beak in what was clearly a grin. The rest of the night passed much easier for Link than it had begun. He and Cass did eventually go back in, and Link enjoyed listening to Cass' music and storytelling, none of which featured him or his previous incarnation. End of chapter